From the first two videos, we've managed to retrieve key terms and concepts associated with monetary policy. In this video, we're going to cast a critical eye on the transmission mechanism and examine what happens if the interest rate transmission mechanism breaks down. In particular, we're going to focus on three areas of the transmission mechanism. And by doing this, this will give us a sound knowledge and understanding to be able to complete an evaluative written exercise at the end of this lesson. If you're following along, there's an accompanying worksheet that you can download from the top of the page, which you can use to make notes as we progress. Let's remind ourselves how our interest rates affect consumer spending. If interest rates rise, this increases borrowing costs, which reduces a rational consumer's incentive to borrow. On the whole, that should lead to falling consumer spending, falling aggregate demand and a reduction in inflationary pressure. Another impact can be that in, when interest rates rise, this creates a bigger incentive to save because we get a greater reward for saving. So consumer spending falls, aggregate demand falls and other things being equal inflationary pressure falls. If interest rates rise, those rates will also rise with variable rate mortgages. So consumers that have a variable rate mortgage have less discretionary income. That will then result in falling consumer spending, falling aggregate demand and falling inflation pressures. So remember, in an ideal world, this is what should happen if monetary policy works. We should see interest rates rising, leading to a fall in aggregate demand and a fall in inflation pressure. But is this always the case? Okay, so a key part of evaluating monetary policy actually involves questioning our initial chain of argument. In other words, we're going to question our prior analysis. And we're going to question each three of these logic chains that we've just built up. So let's start with the first one. When interest rates rise, we said it makes it more expensive to borrow. Where are we borrowing from? Are we borrowing from banks? Are we borrowing from credit cards or from payday loans companies? We then said it gives us less incentive to borrow. Well, actually, those on little or no income may have very little choice but to actually carry on borrowing even if interest rates rise. This might be because, due to their personal circumstances, they may have very little, if any, savings. So actually, even if interest rates go up, they may have an unforeseen bill at the end of a month and they may still need to borrow on a credit card, borrow on a payday loan. So even with interest rates going up, personal circumstances dictate that some people will still have to borrow money. We then said that aggregate demand is going to fall. However, that depends on what happens to the other components of aggregate demand. What's going to happen to exports? What's going to happen to investment? We know that in the UK context, consumption makes up a significant, a significant percentage of aggregate demand, around about 60%. But what happens if we're talking about an economy that isn't the UK, that isn't as highly driven by consumption? Our second logic chain looked at the reward for saving. However, there'll only be a greater reward for saving if commercial banks pass on changes in the bank rate to consumers like you and I. Similarly, it depends upon the rate of return on other assets, for example, shares. Some consumers may see a greater return on buying shares than by saving. Finally, we said that when interest rates rise, there'll be a rise in um, variable rate mortgage payments. Those individuals that are on a fixed rate mortgage payments, or a fixed rate mortgage, I should say, they will not see an increase in their um, outgoings each month. So therefore, will they reduce their consumption? The percentage of households that rent has also risen from 28 to 37% in the last decade. So again, when those interest rates rise, that doesn't necessarily mean that consumers will have less discretionary income. Because if they're renting, that rent will stay the same and it will be not affected by interest rates whatsoever. Let's familiarise ourselves with what should happen when interest rates change and how that can affect business investment. What we're going to try and do here is we're going to try and break this chain in order to develop some evaluation. So let's start off with the first logic chain. When interest rates rise, we said it's more expensive for firms to borrow, but this is only if business finance investment comes from borrowing from banks. Firms may issue corporate bonds, Remember in a previous video, they were discussed those of those IOUs. 
or they could issue shares via the stock market if they're a public limited company or if it's a private limited company they could issue shares to, to more family and friends or they could use any retained profit to finance that further investment. So therefore businesses may not take fewer loans and the rest of our logic chain could therefore become null and void. It's also important to remember that many factors, not just interest rates, affect the number of loans taken out by a business. So credit availability, confidence, demand for the goods that are produced by that firm, there are a number of different ones that we could look at here. These are only some of them. But the key point being that many factors affect the demand for credit and the demand for loans, not just the interest rate itself. Our second evaluation point on business investment interest rates comes from questioning this second logic chain. So we said interest rates will rise, that gives a more reward for saving, and profits are saved and not reinvested. However, let's pause there. Interest rates will probably have to change significantly to alter business investment decisions. It's hard to make decisions at the margin. Okay, There are many other factors that involve investment decision making and not just interest rates. So here's a third transmission mechanism. The impact of a change in interest rates and how that affects international trade and consequently inflationary pressure. Pause the video and re-familiarise yourself with this chain of reasoning. Now, you saw on the previous two slides some of the points that we came up with that we were able to question the logic chain. Over to you now, can you break this chain using your own economic knowledge? So pause the video, give yourself two or three minutes and see which elements you can cast a critical eye over to try and break the chain of analysis. I hope you've managed to jot down a few critical discussion points. Let's see how you've done. We start off again with interest rate rises. That attracts inwards hot money flows. Our first critical point of call can be that, well, that's only going to happen if rates are higher than in other countries. So if the interest rate goes up in the United Kingdom, that will only attract a hot money flow if it's higher than ECB interest rates, interest rates in the United States, etc. In other words, the hot money flows may not occur. Will demand for the currency rise on the Forex market? Well, again, we've got to question other factors that may affect the demand for the currency. Foreign direct investment, demand for exports, speculation are all other factors that affect demand for currency and not just interest rates. You may have picked up on the point related to exports become relatively more expensive. Well, that will only occur if domestic inflation or price levels don't change. An economy may be suffering from other cost push inflationary aspects and therefore domestic price levels will still change anyway. Demand for exports falls and demand for imports rises. Now, what we have to remember here is that this doesn't happen immediately. There's a time lag. Many firms are tied into longer term contracts, committing them to buying or selling for several years. And those contracts can't just be broken. In other words, this doesn't just occur overnight. There's a period of time involved. And finally, when our logic chain says that the value of net trade, exports minus imports falls, that depends upon the price elasticity of demand for exports and imports. If exports are price inelastic, then the rise in price should actually increase revenue from exports. So we're now at a point where we can attempt a written task. We've got two questions shown on screen here. One is rooted in analysis and the other in evaluation. The first one, explain how in theory a fall in the rate of interest should cause the general price level to increase. The second one, evaluate why, in practice, a fall in the interest rate may not cause the general price level to increase. What are we looking for in these two questions? What's our success criteria? Accurate diagrams, supported by strong technical terminology, 
use of connective phrases, which is absolutely paramount in order to develop our, our well-developed points and our chains of reasoning. And we also want evidence of wider reading. What's the real world evidence that you can build into either one of those questions when you are developing your answer? Thank you for listening.